Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to our service of Holy Communion on this the second Sunday in Advent. And we'll just take a few moments just to commend God's presence and feel His peace with us now. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Amen. Amen. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. And the light of the world is the light of the world. And Lord Riley will light our second Advent candle for us. Thank you, Diana. And we'll say by our prayer courses. As we light our apple candle, light the world shine on us. As we prepare for Christmas time, light the world shine on us. In this world of pain and darkness, light the world shine through us. To all the people who don't know you, light the world shine through us. Jesus, you are coming soon. Light the world light the way. In our service here today. Light of the world, light of the way. And we're going to stand now and sing after the candles tell their story. Almighty God, who forgives all, who truly repent, 
have mercy upon me. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we will understand and say another hymn. Glory be to God in heaven. <coughs> so if you'd like to start, please. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion, 
He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. And Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. This is the word of the Lord.
but also giving offence to many people over the years. On the one hand, many people, myself included, through opening their hearts to Jesus Christ, have indeed found that purpose in their lives. They also found somebody to accompany them through life, giving them abundant life. But then, Christ is indeed the only way, the only truth, and the only life. However, in our increasingly pluralistic society, with so many religions and so many ethnic groups living alongside Christians, is it insensitive and intolerant to claim that Jesus is the only way to God, as he himself claimed? Today's issue, which has been suggested by you, is how can I know that my religion is right? Or maybe to frame it in a slightly different way. Is Christianity the only way for people to reach God? Do all religions lead to him or not? So where do we begin? Well, firstly, I think it's interesting to notice how predominant religion is in our world. Mary Fairchild estimates that 85% of the global population identifies with a religious group and that there are over 4,000 different religions. That's an awful lot. And most of that 85% belong to one of these big five major religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism and Hinduism. And of these, by far the biggest group is Christianity, with 31% of the population. And that's followed by Islam, with 25% of the population. But it's interesting that in our own country, those who believe in God are declining. In the 2011 census, 59% of Great Britons profess to belong to the Christian faith. But this week, the 2021 census figures were released, and that shows that in 10 years, that percentage has now dropped to only 46%, under half of our population. And 37% of people say that they've got no religion at all. That's up by nearly a quarter. It seems that people in our part of the world are bucking the trend and turning away from the faith. In many ways, though, we should be surprised, I think, that religion is so predominant in our world. Because that's the way that God has made us. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He set eternity in the hearts of men. Every human being has got a human desire to worship. Some people have said it's like a God-shaped hole in every single one of us. Now often people worship something other than God, whether that be a football team, or shopping, or something else materialistic. But deep down, materialism doesn't satisfy, and this inbuilt desire to worship and search for God just drives us to look for something more in our lives. And even if people haven't heard of Jesus, the Bible says that people can encounter God in nature. <coughs> the heavens declare the glory of God, says Psalm 19. And Romans 1.20 says that God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen in creation. But don't we all look at creation and just marvel? See that hand of the creator there in the beauty of the universe. And then, thirdly, I think in creating God's image, we also all have a conscience inside us that ability to distinguish right from wrong. And it's interesting, I think, that that golden rule, do unto others what you have them do to you, is the basis of almost every religion. So I think the thinking person, looking at the evidence, must conclude that there is a God. And we'll try and, try and sort of search and relate to that God. 
And they'll use their religion to help them understand the reason and the purpose of their existence in the world. But also to ask questions about the origins of life, about the afterlife, and what God is like. The evidence, if we look closely, is there for us to see. And as Paul goes on to say in Romans 1, we're without excuse if we turn our back on that evidence. And the psalmist puts it another way. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. But do all religions lead to God? Personally, I find it quite hard to say that they do. Because the God revealed in each of these religions is very different. The God that I worship and try and serve through Christianity, for example, is very different to the God of the jihadists, who says that it's fine to murder people as a way into paradise. That's not the God that I recognise and say. There's two very different value systems at work there. And likewise, not all religions are monotheistic or recognise that there is only one God. Hinduism, for example, recognises many gods and teaches reincarnation. Buddhism doesn't recognise God at all. It's all about working towards enlightenment. So I think to say all religions lead to God, we need to question that, because they're also very different things in their religion. And I think it's also important to notice that Christianity isn't the only religion that thinks it's right and claims that exclusivity. If you can read this chart, you'll notice that Buddhism, Islam and Judaism all claim that same exclusivity. They think they're right and other religions are wrong. Hinduism doesn't, but it does say that all other religions need to be subsumed into the Hindu system. And that's why I think we see in so many countries of the world that Christianity, but also other minority religions, aren't accepted often and experience persecution. And indeed, I'd argue that out of the five main, main religions, it could be argued that Christianity is actually the most tolerant of them all and does accept other religions are the faiths. However, as Christians, even if we believe our faith to be right, it doesn't mean that we write off other religions. All religions can show us aspects of God's character, can inspire us to serve Him better. The fervency of Islam and the amount of times a day they pray the love that's shown by Buddhists, the evangelical fervour of Jehovah's Witnesses, the respect shown to God by Jews, all of these should really inspire and talk to us and help us maybe to seek to put our own house in order and live closer to the God we're trying to serve. And I think in the same way in our increasingly secular society, those of our faith should be our allies in speaking up for God and fighting for certain values in our society, seeking to roll back those times of secularism and materialism. So we should be working all together with these other religions. But let's just return to that original question. How do I know if my religion, and again, in most of our cases, that's Christianity, is right. And certainly maybe it does depend on where we're born and our conditioning. If I was born in India, it would be likely that I would be a Hindu and would think that that system was right. If I was born in Asia, I could be a Buddhist and would think that that system was right. But I think in answering that question, is my religion right? Maybe we should all ask ourselves two questions. First of all, does it work for me? And secondly, what is the fruit? Has my religion given me peace 
joy, love, and that abundant life that Christ talked about. Has it taken away my fear of dying? Is it helping me to lead a better, more fruitful life? I've noticed that, that all these religions claim that exclusivity, and we shouldn't therefore be ashamed to speak up for our faith. And maybe even Jesus' claim that John has just read to us, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to God. In an earlier sermon in this series, Carol was preaching on the marginalisation of Christianity. And she outlined three positions that we can adopt. First of all, there's that imposition where we force our views on other people. And the opposite of that is laissez faire, where we just let everyone get on with their own beliefs, do what they want to do. And both of these positions she suggested is come wrong. And we should be taking up a third position, and that is a position of persuasion. Seeking just to talk about our faith, not being ashamed of it, and entering into discussion with others, sharing with them what we believe. And this, I'm sure, is the way forward for us as we meet with those other faiths and discuss and share our position respectfully but firmly with them. Because I think the thing that we can't get away from is that Christianity is actually very different to most other religions. Most religions are about our efforts to reach God, usually by doing good works or becoming increasingly enlightened. But by, Christ, by contrast, Christianity says something very different. It's about a saviour, somebody who comes to save us. Our faith believes that although we try and live well and correctly, we constantly fail and fall short. We fall short of our own standards, let alone God's. And that's why God sent his Son into our world, to live a sinless life before dying in our place on the cross, and pay the penalty for all our failure and all our sin. And this is where Christianity is very different. Because in contrast, all the other religions say, say that none of those other religions actually say that God entered our world to save us. <coughs> Just imagine for a moment, I'm drowning. I don't want somebody to tell me how to swim, to give me lots of rules and instructions. I don't even want a life ring thrown into it just to help me keep my head above the water. What I do want is somebody to dive in and rescue me and pull me to safety onto, to, onto the shore. And this, I think, is exactly what God has done for us. In a sense, diving into our world, becoming one of us and rescuing us. And then, other religion claims that. And that's why Jesus said what he did, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And I think there's other ways that Christianity is quite unique as well. Because of the resurrection, Jesus is still alive today. We worship, serve, and relate to a living Saviour, as we're going to be singing about at the end of our service. Muhammad, Buddha, and others are all dead. But Jesus is still alive. And what's more, he lives within us through his Holy Spirit. As Paul says in Colossians 1, the mystery is now declared, is disclosed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he also says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So we serve and know a risen Saviour, and that's what makes our faith, Christianity, unique. It's not about keeping the rules and trying to live the right way. It's about knowing God and living 
in a relationship with him, with him, accepted by him through grace. And through his spirit living in us, hopefully we're being transformed daily to be more and more like Christ. Just increasing, but increasingly demonstrating those fruits of the spirit in our life. So just to conclude, all religions, I think, can show us aspects of God and the right way to live. But it's only Christianity that has a saviour. And that's why Jesus said that nobody can come to the Father except through him. And maybe a good picture is that all faiths are actually paths going up a mountain towards God. But also, ultimately, all those paths lead to one single and one unique path which can take us that final way into God's presence. As Peter, the Apostle, having met the risen Christ for himself said in Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And that, this is what we as Christians believe. And it's a truth that we don't force on people. But neither should we keep quiet about it. If we've discovered for ourselves the way to God, our faith works for us. That news is too good just to sit on. We should share it with other people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that you are our saviour, that you entered our world and that you rescued us. Thank you that you're alive today, living and can live in our hearts through faith. We just pray that you will help us to share that love with other people, to be able to talk about our faith and point them to the God who loves them. We ask this now in Jesus' name. I don't know how you speak, but I'm glad to be a Christian after this morning, our God lives. It's really good to know. And now, if you'd like to stand, we're going to say together the creed. We believe in one God. We believe in one God.
Let us take your, take your word with us and be that light to everyone we meet. That kind of voice, the ear that listens, renew us with the Holy Spirit every morning. Lord, in your mercy, yes, Lord. we pray for our church leaders, clergy, churches in our community. May people be drawn through the doors at this special time of year to experience kindness, hospitality, and season's greetings. May our churches be that special place for sanctuary and peace away from our busy, chaotic lives. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We pray for our children in the faith factor and children everywhere. We pray for parents worried about their child's behaviour or future. Children who have lost a parent through this year, and this will be your first Christmas without them. We pray for the parents who have lost children to strep A. <coughs> Give us the courage to reach out at this time of year and help those in our community. We pray for people who volunteer for various things at this time of year which are all worthwhile causes. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. we think of the lonely and the bereaved, those perhaps spending their first home in their, their first Christmas in a nursing home. Let them be your reassurance and guidance. We pray for the bereaved, those in our parish who are spending their first Christmas without their spouse, those who are ill or having treatment for various diseases, be that strength for them, Lord, at this time when they may be lacking in strength. We pray for the family of Robert Paul, who was buried on Thursday. We pray for all on our intercessor lists. And we pray for people on our own hearts and minds. We lift them all to you, Lord, in a few moments of prayer. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our rubbish world. Help us to do our little bit for the environment to pass on to future generations. Fill our leaders with the Holy Spirit. Give them wisdom in their hearts to turn away from greed and power. To show kindness and humility. There are so many countries at war at the moment or where disasters have struck, struck. Be that strong and steady hand guiding them. That force that always has hope, hope, hope. You love all your children, Lord. And we can't understand how you do so many things. Fill us all with your love at this time of year. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say together the prayer of the Lord. We do not presume. Thank you. 
Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to one God and one God. <coughs> By the cross we meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And now we cannot preach under a sign of the peace. And now we're going to sing another hymn. Hello of the Lord, rejoice.
He made there the one complete and all-sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted, and in his holy gospel, commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. And on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. When he gave thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he gave thanks to you, he gave it to him, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we do as Christ, your Son, command. We remember his passion and We celebrate his resurrection and We look for the coming of his kingdom. Accept through him our great high priest. This our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, grant by the power of the life giving spirit, that we may be made one in your holy church and partakers of the body and blood of your Son, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory of Jesus, Almighty Father, forever and ever. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we're bold to say, Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, how will be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
Keep us firm in the hope that you set before us, so that we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together, Almighty God.
just before the final blessing, just to share with you if you haven't heard, we've had two uh, long-term members of our church die in the last 24 hours. Uh, it's very sadly, John Cherry had a heart attack in hospital uh, yesterday. And just overnight, Janet Crilly has passed away as well. So perhaps we could just have a moment of silence now to remember them both and just pray for their families as well. And now may Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And make you ready to meet him when he comes again in glory. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and upon all those that you love, this day and forever. Amen. Our Lord says, I am coming soon. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the Lord, when he comes, find us watching and living. Amen. Thank you for being with us for our service of Holy Communion on this second Sunday of Advent. Our first reading was read by the Reverend Andy Heber. Our second reading was read by John Fenton. Uh, the service was led by Sharon Ferguson with the Reverend Andy Heber preaching and our organist was David Rutherford. Thank you for being with us and we hope you join us again next week for our service of morning prayer.